welcome everyone to the sixth lecture on nonlinear dynamical systems so we will continue with existence and uh, uniqueness of solutions to differential equations in the last lecture we already saw that under locally lipschitz condition on f we are assured of a solution only for an interval 0 to delta this interval 0 to delta may be very large or may be small but it is only finite that is all that is assured by uh, locally Lipschitz property of the function f. We also saw an example x dot is equal to x square. What is important about this? The function f of x is equal to x square is locally Lipschitz. In fact, it is differentiable at every point. Yeah? At any point x is equal to 100, x is equal to minus 2000 the function is differentiable hence it is locally Lipschitz at that point hence at every point it is locally Lipschitz. But we also saw that for every initial condition x naught greater than 0 the solution exists only for a finite interval for a finite duration from 0 to some delta max. Yeah? So, the interval is an open is semi open is what is called a semi open it is closed on one side it is closed on this side and open on this side. Yeah? So, for whatever x naught we choose as long as it is positive and non-zero it turns out that the solution exists only for a finite duration. So, this delta max could be very large this is possible when x naught is very small, but delta max cannot be assured to be equal to infinity yeah? it is possible to have only a finite duration unfortunately because this function is locally Lipschitz we have a finite duration of time for which the solution exists and is unique, but we cannot have uh, global existence. So, the question arises can solutions exist for all time greater than or equal to 0. In other words, does can we have conditions on f such that the solution exists for all t from 0 to infinity. After all for linear systems this is true given that it is true for linear systems x dot is equal to a x where a is a n by n matrix we would like to ask the question under what conditions on f a little more general than linearity can we have solutions that exist globally uh, on the interval 0 to infinity. So, here we have a theorem global existence and uniqueness. So, suppose f from R n to R n is globally Lipschitz that is what is globally Lipschitz? this particular inequality f x minus f y is less than or equal to some l times x minus y norm of x minus y for all x y and r n there is one constant l that works for all vectors x and y in r n. This inequality is satisfied for no matter which x and y in r n we put the same constant l will work. So, this is what we saw was globally Lipschitz property of the function f. If this is satisfied then the theorem states that for every initial condition x naught in R n the state equation x dot is equal to f of x with x naught as the initial condition has a unique solution defined over the interval 0 to infinity. So, here we have as soon as you assume that there is one constant L that works for this Lipschitz inequality for all x and y in R n that is enough to assure us that there is a solution on the interval 0 to infinity and moreover that solution is unique. So, because we have the 0 to infinity interval we have called this theorem the global existence and uniqueness theorem. So, consider the linear system, system x dot is equal to f of x is equal to a x where a is a n by n constant matrix since all the elements of A are bounded in fact, they are all constants there exists a number L such that A x is less than or equal to L times a norm of A x is at most L times norm of x there is some constant L that will ensure that this inequality is satisfied for all x. So, what are candidates L for this particular inequality we could take for example, the maximum singular value of the matrix A when we are dealing with the two norm the Euclidean norm as the norm here. We have this norm and in general L depends on the particular norm whichever norm you take 
there will be a constant L such that this inequality is satisfied for all x in R n. So, linear systems x dot is equal to A x in that A x is a globally Lipschitz function and hence we have existence and uniqueness of the solution over the interval 0 to infinity. More generally even if we do not have a linear system, if we have a globally Lipschitz property that is sufficient to assure us existence and uniqueness of solutions on the interval 0 to infinity. So, we will have a quick summary of the various things we have seen so far. So, x, x naught let x naught be an equilibrium point for the system x naught is equal to f of x. Then we have seen various properties of the solutions locally ex, local existence we have yes for linear for locally Lipschitz f also we have local existence of solutions for globally Lipschitz f we have locally ex, local existence of solutions to the differential equation for non Lipschitz we are not able to say anything. What about locally unique of course, it is again yes 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 for global existence of solutions of course, yes for linear for locally Lipschitz we are not able to assure for globally Lipschitz yes we just now saw that. What about finite escape time is it possible that solutions exist only for a finite duration of time beyond which it goes to infinity this is what we call escape time. So, for linear systems this cannot happen for locally Lipschitz we are not able to say for globally Lipschitz it cannot happen because we already showed that the solutions exist over the interval 0 to infinity. So, it cannot escape to it cannot become unbounded in finite time for non Lipschitz again we are not able to say anything. The next important question is is it possible to come out of an equilibrium point x naught is the equilibrium point. So, if a solution starts at an equilibrium point is it possible that at some time instant it comes out of the equilibrium point so, this is not possible for linear this is not possible for locally Lipschitz it is not possible for globally Lipschitz why because globally Lipschitz is also locally Lipschitz and the solution is unique for some interval and hence it cannot come out. But for non Lipschitz this is possible this we have already seen is it also possible to come into an equilibrium point yeah there is a solution that is initially out of the equilibrium point is it possible that at some time instant it comes and merges with the solution that is always sitting at the equilibrium point. So, this is not possible for linear this is not possible under local Lipschitz property for global Lipschitz also it says a question mark here, but it is not possible for non Lipschitz this is possible. So, what is the significance about this we might require to reach an equilibrium point in finite time for example, the steady state the set point we might require to reach there in finite time this is not possible under for linear systems for locally Lipschitz property of f it is not possible for globally Lipschitz also you might require a non Lipschitz dynamical system if you want to reach the equilibrium point at any finite time. So, come out of and come into an equilibrium point we mean here is at finite time. We, we have also seen some examples the examples of linear system non Lipschitz uh, unstable non Lipschitz stable globally locally Lipschitz, but not globally Lipschitz unstable locally Lipschitz, but not globally Lipschitz stable. Okay, so, we will proceed with one other theorem about global existence and uniqueness that does not assume globally Lipschitz condition on the function f. So, before we see that theorem we will just analyze that theorem about global existence and uniqueness of solutions under the globally Lipschitz property of the function f. What were the drawbacks of that theorem? f in linear systems happens to be globally Lipschitz and hence the solution exists for all time t greater than or equal to 0. For non-linear systems globally Lipschitz condition rules out several common examples. Yeah, it is too much to ask for a function to be globally Lipschitz. Locally Lipschitz of course, is satisfied by several examples and this is something we would like to retain. So, it is it is perhaps possible to have existence and uniqueness of solution over the interval 0 to infinity, but without requiring f 
to be globally Lipschitz. Yeah, the condition we saw was only sufficient condition for existence of solution from 0 to infinity was that f is globally Lipschitz. Maybe there are some other weaker conditions on f under which we will have existence of solutions and uniqueness over the interval 0 to infinity. So, this requires us to review compact sets, open, closed and bounded sets. This is something we will quickly review. A subset S of the set X is called compact if S is both bounded and a closed subset of X. When do we call a subset S open in X? A subset S is called open in X if for every point X in S, one can find some epsilon neighborhood of X of that point X such that that whole neighborhood is contained in the set S. Yeah, so, this neighborhood is defined like we have seen so far, set of all points which are less than epsilon distance away from the point X. This is an epsilon neighborhood of the point X, the set of all points in X such that the distance is less than epsilon and this epsilon is greater than 0. So, if a set S is called open, if no matter which point X you take, after you have chosen the point X, you are able to find some epsilon greater than 0 such that that epsilon neighborhood of the point X is contained not just in X, but in S. When do we call a subset S of X closed subset of X? We call it closed in X if the complement of S in X is open. So, this has another way, uh, we can define this in another way by saying that the, all the boundary points are contained inside the subset S, but that we have seen before, we, we will not review that part now. Finally, when do we call a set S bounded? If all the elements are bounded from some number R in the norm. So, a set S is bounded if there is some number R greater than 0 such that norm of every element X is at most R. So, all elements in S are not more than distance R away from the origin in this case. We also need the notion of an invariant set. So, a set S is said to be invariant. This invariant here is with respect to some operation. In this case, it is with respect to the dynamics of x dot is equal to f of x. So, a set S is said to be an invariant set with respect to x dot is equal to f of x if whenever the initial condition is inside, sorry there is a small mistake here, this S should be replaced by m. So, a set m is said to be an invariant set if whenever the initial condition starts inside m, the trajectory is inside m for all t greater than or equal to 0. In other words, if the solution is in m at some time instant, then it remains in m for all future. That is the definition of a set m to be invariant. So, please replace this s with m. So, finally, we have another condition for existence and uniqueness of solutions over the interval 0 to infinity. So, let f of x be locally Lipschitz on a domain D. So, we are assuming only locally Lipschitz, please note. Let w be a compact subset of D. Yeah, and this initial condition, some initial condition x naught is in W. Suppose it is known that for every initial condition inside this compact subset W, we have that the whole solution lies inside the compact subset W. Suppose it is known that every solution of x naught is equal to f of x with the initial condition in x naught lies entirely in W and this is required to be true for every initial condition x naught in W. If it is known, then there is a unique solution defined over the interval 0 to infinity. Yeah, the solution exists and is also unique over the interval 0 to infinity. Notice that we have only local, locally Lipschitz condition on f, but we have this additional property that there is some compact subset W such that whenever it starts inside W, the whole trajectory for whatever interval it is defined, that trajectory remains inside W, inside this compact subset. In other words, this W is an invariant set. For whatever time interval the solution exists, the solution does not leave the set W. In other words, 
the set W is invariant under the dynamics of F. If, if somebody gives us this compact subset W which is invariant under the dynamics of F and if F is just locally Lipschitz, then we have a solution defined not just over an interval 0 to delta, but in fact 0 to infinity. So, for whatever duration that uh, solution exists, that is an important thing here. Okay, so, this completes uh, existence and uniqueness of solutions, uh, our study about that, we saw locally Lipschitz property, global ellipsis property and finally, we have seen that if there is a compact set that is invariant, then also the solutions can be assured to be uh, assured to exist and it is unique over the interval 0 to infinity. We will now move on to stability, to the notion of stability. What do we want to say about stability of an equilibrium point? So, we would like to say that a solution starting at equilibrium point, of course, we know that solution starting at an equilibrium point remains there, but what about nearby initial conditions? Can we say that solution starting nearby also remain, remain nearby? So, stability is what? Solution starting nearby, near an equilibrium point remain nearby. So, we are going to try to quantify this nearby and this nearby. So, one should also note that the definition of stability itself has evolved like solutions evolve for a dynamical system, even the notion of definition of stability, even the notion of stability has evolved over the last few decades and uh, finally, it has converged to what we will see in the next slide. So, this is best understood as this particular definition is best understood as, as a challenge. Yeah? So, it is like somebody proposes a challenge and somebody who is facing the challenge tries to answer tries to meet that challenge. So, what is this challenge proposer facer definition of stability? So, consider the nonlinear system given by x rod is equal to f of x in which at any time t x of t is an element of R n, x has n components. Let 0 be an equilibrium point. So, for convenience we are assuming that the origin itself is the equilibrium point if it is not origin that is the equilibrium point, but some other equilibrium point we are studying, we can just shift the coordinates there and be studying with new coordinates. In the new coordinates, the origin is again the equilibrium point. So, let 0 be an equilibrium point that is f 0 is equal to 0, then the equilibrium point 0 is called stable if for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists some delta greater than 0 such that for every initial condition x naught inside this ball, inside this ball centered at 0 and of radius delta. For every initial condition inside this, we have the property that x of t belongs to this other ball again centered at 0 and of radius epsilon for all t greater than or equal to 0. So, when do we call the equilibrium point stable? Somebody proposes that for this epsilon can you find a delta? The equilibrium point will be called stable if no matter what epsilon somebody proposes, we are able to find the delta greater than 0 such that as long as you start inside this initial, as long as your initial condition is inside this delta ball, your whole trajectory lies inside this epsilon ball. Yeah? So, this star condition here is a very important condition where the delta, where the epsilon comes here is a very important part of the definition. This star can also be replaced by whenever x 0 is inside the ball, the ball of uh, radius delta centered at the origin an open ball. The whole trajectory is guaranteed to be inside this other epsilon ball. Epsilon is what somebody else proposes to us and delta is what we are able to calculate and find we can also replace the star by for every initial condition x naught inside the ball b 0 comma delta, we have x of t inside this other ball b 0 comma epsilon for all time 0 to infinity. So, uh, what I have said uh, in the previous slide, this challenger is the person who gives an epsilon and tells can you ensure that the whole trajectory remains inside uh, b 0 comma epsilon. After some calculation, the facer of that challenge, the person who meets the challenge says, yes, take this delta, 
just start inside this ball b 0 comma delta and if you start inside this ball b 0 comma delta we are guaranteed to be inside this other ball b 0 comma epsilon. So, the fact that we are allowed to do some calculation means that delta is allowed to depend on epsilon. So, if you are able to meet this challenge for every epsilon no matter how, how small that is when you will call the equilibrium point as stable. Smaller epsilon might mean a smaller delta, yeah? hence delta is shown to be dependent on epsilon in the previous slide in the definition. So, this is uh, we should be seeing a figure here. This is a time axis for the purpose of this figure x has only one component and 0 is the equilibrium point. So, of course, starting at 0 we have the constant solution, the solution always remains at 0, but somebody proposes as an epsilon ball. So, this minus epsilon to plus epsilon band is here and by our convention our um, epsilon ball is an open ball in other words this boundary epsilon we should not touch. So, somebody proposes this epsilon ball and tells can you ensure that the trajectory remains inside this epsilon ball. So, after some calculation we come up with this delta. So, that as long as the initial condition starts inside this it might leave the delta ball of course, but it will remain inside this epsilon ball. Yeah? So, for for the trajectory to remain inside this epsilon ball, this is a 0, this is another figure with x, sorry. So, this epsilon which is being shown large could also be very small, this is what the challenger decides how small epsilon should be. is a 0. So, once this epsilon is given we might we might know that the trajectories might have to start within this very small interval. The interval within which it should start so that it is guaranteed to remain inside this big a ball yeah so, this is the ball this what I am showing is the diameter the radius is this, this is the radius and this is the diameter. For it to remain inside this bigger ball, it is possible that we should ensure that the initial condition lies inside this smaller ball. Yeah? As long as it begins from here, from the solutions to the differential equation, we know that it remains inside this epsilon ball. Another solution here also remains inside this epsilon ball. Of course, this solution might also remain inside this epsilon ball but it is possible that every solution inside with this much distance does not remain inside this epsilon ball. To ensure that it remains inside this epsilon ball, we are forced to make this delta very small maybe. So, but the fact that this delta is greater than 0 is what defines this particular equilibrium point as stable. That no matter what epsilon somebody gives us, we are able to do some calculation and propose this delta. So, that if the initial condition starts inside this delta ball, the whole trajectory remains inside this epsilon ball. So, one is this once this epsilon is specified, is this delta unique? Yeah. If, if suppose after a lot of calculation we have found this delta and somebody else does a similar calculation but obtains a different delta, can we say that one of the two deltas is wrong because the delta should be unique? or is it possible that for the same epsilon there are many deltas. Yeah, so, this is a question that we can answer without too much effort. So, this this is only a guarantee. Suppose, this is our epsilon ball. And after a lot of calculation, one person finds this delta ball. Yeah? If we start inside this interval, then the trajectory is supposed to remain will is guaranteed to remain inside this epsilon ball, but the same guarantee will automatically be satisfied for this smaller band also. If the initial conditions start inside this smaller ball, then also it is guaranteed to remain inside this epsilon ball. 
why because once we are sure that starting anywhere inside this initial condition band assures that the solution lies inside this epsilon ball then we know that inside a smaller band also if we have begun we are guaranteed to remain inside this epsilon ball of course this smaller one the smaller initial condition ball is a more conservative one but this only tells that the delta is not unique once we have found a delta greater than 0 we can take another delta that is strictly smaller and positive and still that uh, delta which uh, comes in the definition of stability that delta that condition is satisfied for this smaller and positive delta also. This is only to note that delta is not unique one could ask the question can we make this delta larger and larger and for each epsilon there might be a unique largest possible delta in that sense it might be unique. Uh, okay, so, it is also clear that when epsilon is made smaller then we might have to make the delta smaller. One could ask the question in general is delta what is the relation between delta and epsilon our figure appears to show that the delta is smaller than epsilon but in general should such a relation be satisfied the delta is smaller than epsilon or delta greater than epsilon or should such a relation need not does such a relation need not exist. So, this please note that this is called the definition of stability in the sense of Lyapunov. Yeah, this is just a definition this is not Lyapunov's theorem on stability. So, the, the reason that we have emphasized we have spent lot of discussion on stability on the definition of stability is because it is a difficult concept and to understand the definition properly is very important to understand the theorems on stability. So, before we proceed to the Lyapunov's theorem on stability we note that what we have seen so far is the definition of stability in the sense of Lyapunov. After having seen stability what do, what, do, what do we mean by asymptotic stability? So, in the definition of stability once we are given an epsilon we were required to find a delta that meets a certain condition in addition to that condition required in the definition of stability if delta can also be chosen to satisfy this additional condition that x of t goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. Yeah, so, what was 0? The equilibrium point x of t converges to the equilibrium point as t goes to infinity then the equilibrium point 0 is said to be not just stable, but in fact asymptotically stable. So, we will call the equilibrium point asymptotically stable if it is stable for it to be stable we already know that for every epsilon we have to be able to find a delta such that uh, all initial conditions starting inside the delta ball uh, are guaranteed to have the entire solution inside the epsilon ball. This delta which was chosen to satisfy this condition in addition to that if it can also be chosen to satisfy this additional condition that the solution converges to 0 the equilibrium point as t tends to infinity then that equilibrium point is not just stable, but also asymptotically stable. It was already stable because delta satisfied the condition that the definition of stability required. In addition to that condition it has delta satisfies this additional condition and hence that equilibrium point is asymptotically stable. For every initial condition inside the delta ball we also have x of t goes to 0 as t tends to infinity. Solution starting close by not just remain close by remain close by is what x of t is contained inside the epsilon ball meant. So, they not just remain close by, but in fact converge to the equilibrium point we had assumed that 0 is the equilibrium point. So, the solution should also converge to the equilibrium point for every initial condition starting inside the delta ball. If this is satisfied then we will say that the equilibrium point is asymptotically stable. So, asymptotically stable naturally means that the equilibrium point is also stable but not vice versa. For just stability we do not require that the solutions converge to 0, we only require the solutions to remain inside an epsilon neighborhood. So, we now come to Lyapunov's theorem on stability. After having seen the, the definitions of stability and asymptotic stability in the sense of Lyapunov, we are now going to see Lyapunov's theorem on stability. Let x of 0 be an equilibrium point 
and let d be a domain that contains this equilibrium point. Let v be a function from d to r. Yeah? So, the domain d is a subset of r n. V takes its values from this d and is scalar valued. Yeah? V does not take vectors as its values, it takes only a scalar. Hence, r at any point x, v of x has only one component. Let v be a continuously differentiable function. So, it is v itself is continuous and its derivative is also continuous. That is the meaning of continuously differentiable function such that v satisfies some conditions v of 0, the 0 the equilibrium point at 0 v is equal to 0 and inside that domain at every other point v is positive, v is allowed to be 0 only at the equilibrium point at other points it is positive. Secondly, v dot is less than or equal to 0, so, we have missed a 0 here, v dot is less than or equal to 0 in the domain D. So, uh, v was a function of x, but this dot here means it is a derivative with respect to time, this I will clarify very soon. So, the rate of change of v with respect to time at every point is less than or equal to 0. If we are able to find such a v which is continuously differentiable, which is positive everywhere except at 0 where it is allowed to be equal to 0 and v dot is non-positive, it is less than or equal to 0 in D. If, we, if there is some v that satisfies these three conditions, then the equilibrium point 0 is stable, is a stable equilibrium point. So, what is important to clarify is this v was not a function of time it was a function of x it was an x took its values in r n, but how do we go ahead and differentiate v with respect to time? This is one important point that requires a clarification. So, v was a map from r n to r, yeah? why because x at any time instant was in r n. Our domain d was a subset of r n for the time being we assume that d is equal to r n. Hence, our function v was a map from r n to r. If a function v was not a function of time, how do we go ahead and differentiate v with respect to time? This is something we will quickly see. So, this v we are going to evaluate at different points x, but through each point we have a trajectory that evolves with respect to time. So, v actually depends on x which itself depends on time. Yeah? So, because x is changing with respect to time, as x moves to another point, value of v will also change. In this sense, v depends on time also. Suppose this is our phase space, this is x 1, this is x 2 and this is some point and this is a trajectory that is evolving with respect to time and at this particular time, at some time t 1, it was here at another time t 2, it has moved to this point because x itself is changing. Along this trajectory, we can see how the function v is changing. v has some value at this point, some value at this point, some value at this point. Similarly, v has some value at this point. Immediately after this, immediately further along this trajectory, v has a different value. Similarly, as the x evolves along this trajectory, the value of v of the function v is also changing. In that sense, v is a function of time also, because we are evaluating v along a trajectory x. So, we will see what it means to differentiate v with respect to time now. So, v of x and x itself depend on time t. So, d by dt, this is uh, what we call a composite function v depends on x, while x itself is a function of time. So, d by dt of v of x of t is equal to partial derivative of v with respect to x, partial derivative of v with respect to x, because v itself depends on many variables x 1 up to x n and hence this derivative is not an ordinary derivative, but a partial derivative and then x dx by dt 
x itself depends on only one variable time, one independent variable time and hence this is dx by dt. So, if v depends on x1, x2, x3, then this is nothing but del v by del x1, del v by del x2, del v by del x3 times x1 dot, x2 dot, x3 dot. So, throughout this course, the dot we will reserve for derivative with respect to time. If it is derivative with respect to x or some other variable, then we will just write d by dx del del by del x of v. So, v dot which we saw in our slide is supposed to be is to be understood like this. v was a function of x, v in fact depend on x 1, x 2 and x 3, x 1 itself was a function of time, x 2 was a function of time and x 3 was a function of time. Hence, differentiating v with respect to time is nothing but del v by del x 1 times x 1 dot plus del v by del x 2 times x 2 dot plus del v by del 3 del v by del x 3 times x 3 dot. This is the meaning of v dot. Thus, at each point in the phase space for this for this figure we are our x has only two components. At each point v has some value. This is like v is v is a it is a scalar function. At each point x, x is a vector, but the value of v at each point is a scalar and it, this is like temperature of, of a room at each point. The temperature itself has only one component and as the trajectory moves through each point, there is some trajectory. This is the direction in which the x trajectory moves. At Given that these trajectories are all well defined at each point, we can associate the rate of change of v at each point. Yeah. At each at each point, there is also not just v defined, but also rate of change of v with respect to time defined for each point. That rate of change is it is possible to define that because we have all these trajectories defined at each point, and the trajectories themselves have some rate of change defined for them. So, this uh, for those who are more interested in this topic, this brings in uh, use of Lie derivative techniques into dynamical systems. It is not required for this course. As far as we are concerned, we want to uh, understand the meaning of v dot even though v was a function of x and not time. So, uh, here at each point x, not just v, but v dot is also defined because we have a differential equation differential equation x dot is equal to f of x. So, th that one also remains to be written in this slide x is equal to 0 is an equilibrium point of the dynamical system x dot is equal to f of x. So, with respect to that dynamical system v dot x is defined. What is v dot of x? In general it is del v by del x times f of x. Why? Because this is nothing but del v by del x times x dot and this is what d by dt of v of x is which we have denoted by v dot. This dot here we will reserve only for rate of change with respect to time. So, at every point x there is a v dot defined and if that is less than or equal to 0, the 0 is also missing here. If that is less than or equal to 0, then the equilibrium point 0 is stable. Further, yeah, in addition, in addition to less than or equal to 0, if this v dot, if this v function v is such that it is continuously differentiable, it is 0, it is equal to 0 only at the equilibrium point 0 and it is positive at every other point and if it is strictly less than 0 over the domain d except 0. In the domain at all the points except the point 0, if it is strictly negative, then the equilibrium point is not just stable but it is asymptotically stable. So, this is Lyapunov's theorem on stability. So, please note that this is only a sufficient condition for stability. 
when do we call the equilibrium point 0 of the dynamical system x dot is equal to f of x stable we have a definition of stability one of the ways to prove that it is stable is if you can find some function v that is continuously differentiable whose rate of change is less than or equal to 0 and which is equal to 0 at the point and it is positive at every other point if it satisfies these three conditions then that v we will call a Lyapunov function and that Lyapunov function helps us to prove that this equilibrium point is stable. If such a function v we pick if we pick a function v and it does not satisfy these three conditions then we are not able to conclude that the equilibrium point is not stable. It just means that perhaps this function v should have been chosen more properly more judiciously there might exist another function v that satisfies these three conditions and helps prove and helps to prove that the equilibrium point is stable. This is only one sufficient condition to prove that the equilibrium point is stable. We will see these things in more detail in the following lectures. We also saw a sufficient condition uh, for proving asymptotic stability. This particular function v is called the Lyapunov function and we will see these functions in more detail and some examples in the following lecture. Thank you.